welcome. Um, so, um, what is today is what Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday, December twenty second. Uh, thank you so much, Carlos, for joining us. So, just a brief introduction. I'm Kamran Apari. I teach communication studies at Cal State LA. I also teach at Lancaster Prison. We have a bachelor's degree in communication studies at the prison. I've been there since 2017. Um, teaching interpersonal communication, health communication, uh, and doing some performances as a drama therapist. Um, just briefly, so myself and Elizabeth, who just joined, uh, Marianne and Lynn, we've had this kind of a workshop together, hi Elizabeth, uh, together for the last two years, doing a lot of interviews with drama therapists, going back to the 1970s and 80s, um, working in prisons, with a lot of people who've had experience of performances, therapeutic healing performance experiences in prison or outside of prison or related to uh, incarceration work. And so we've done quite a bit of those interviews as well too. And so we're, we're basically just, you know, want to get, gather some information about what is that experience like? What is it like to, um, you know, how does the experience of doing performance in prison affect your views uh, of uh, what rehabilitation means, what you know, gender norms, um, uh, racial uh, you know, uh, attitudes that people have, just all the ways in which it can have an effect and impact. Uh, also very much, you know, of course, about the uh, sort of the, the sense of self that we have you know, as performance as well too. So that's just a brief introduction. I've done quite a few performances and I'll be happy to share some of the links with you as well to with the guys in Lancaster. We've done animation documentaries and journal publications. So I just wanted to briefly introduce myself and then I'll just hand it over to the other ones as well. So Carlos, hi, I don't know if you remember me from way back. I think it was- I remember you. Yeah, okay, it was yeah. 2014. 2014, when I started, you were one of the first people I met at San Quentin. I actually remember that very well. And we did Merry Wives of Windsor, and then also working with the parallel plays, and then coming back just about as much as I could every year, if I could, to come see your performances. And um, now, so since then, I started at Solano. Um, that was 2014 as well, I believe. And now then started the program at Folsom, at Old Folsom, as well as Folsom Women's, the Shakespeare for Social Justice. And now I'm also teaching social work at full, through Folsom Lake College at um, Mule Creek and at Folsom State Prison. So kind of expanding besides Shakespeare, using the, the therapeutic side as well with social work. So I've been doing a little bit of both of that. So. Excited to, to talk with you tonight and see how things are going for you now. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm Marianne, and I, uh, we know each other because I work at St. Quentin when it's open. Um, Carlos has been in my Friday class since 2014, and I also added on um, H unit on Wednesday nights. So, um, been overlapping quite a bit uh, with Carlos. And then we um, just did a project together recently. I actually didn't get to work with you. Soraya was your director on that, but um, it's great to see that you're out. Thank you. I'll quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'll stop the video when you speak, so I'm not recording with my baby, but um, I'm Elizabeth Malone and um, my background is in acting, but I became a drama therapist and have been working with uh, Dr. Afari Cameron inside the Lancaster prison, as well as local um, jails uh, for men and women, mostly men. And um, yeah, I really love uh, going into these spaces and it's really changed my life for the better. Um, and so thank you so much for just being here tonight and taking your time and, and sharing your story. I'm Carlos, um, was incarcerated for 25 years, didn't start doing uh, any type of theater or performance until I was in San Quentin in roughly 2012. Um, and uh, worked with a lot of different uh, people 
um, yeah, you know, did different things in there um, and uh, utilized every outlet that I could to uh, reveal my humanity. Who wants to ask a question or open up something? Yeah, I do. I want to hear more about that, that revealing your humanity and what that, what that meant for you as far as maybe discovering that as well. I'll say uh, um, my incarceration experience was um, dehumanizing it in and of itself because it always made me uh, understand myself as either a commodity or a criminal. And um, I always knew I was neither. I was a human being first. And so um, I would put myself in places where I could reveal my humanity um, because really like nobody, nobody really helped me um, rehabilitate. You know what I mean? Most of what I did was on my own. I sought those places like most incarcerated, everything we, we do uh, we do for ourselves in a way like nobody can make us do anything. And usually when somebody find, uh, 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 comes in and, and meets us, um, we find a lot of savior complex in that, or, you know, I'm going to help you. And it's, I really don't need the help. Uh, what I need is for people to see me as human. And um, there's always that, that weird understanding that people are coming into um, for those of us who have been in for more than like 10 years, we've already began to um, examine our lives in a way where when we get out, how we want to, how we want to present to the world. I won't say everybody, but I'll say the majority of us are that way. And so, like I said, when we try to find avenues to reveal our humanity, one of the things for me was performance art and Shakespeare and stuff. Uh, because I could show my emotion there, you know, I could show that I was able-bodied um, and, it, and it was a space that we created to be able to see each other on a more humane basis. Um, it really takes people back when they would sit in a group with us because we, we don't, we weren't, um, what most people expected. Most people uh, don't expect us to be able to articulate, to speak well, to understand Shakespeare, to do all these things. And, you know, we are actually, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, how can I put it? I'm not stupid, I'm smart. I may not be learned in an area, it doesn't mean that I can't learn it. And a lot of people forget that when they come into incarcerated spaces. And there's a, there's a wonderful thing that happens in that we have to hold on to what we know of ourselves without believing what people come in and tell us about us. And so that's what I mean by revealing my humanity is I have to take the time to be patient with a teacher who already has a predisposed idea of who I am. That I'm either um, still hurting in my wounding or in my trauma. And for the most part, most of us have dealt with our trauma when we get to certain uh, places and certain avenues, otherwise we wouldn't be there. And what I mean we've, we've dealt with our trauma is um, a lot of us acted out, we were upset, we were angry, and we were violent in so many different respects. But when we made it to a level two or a level three or a level one, um, more than likely we weren't in those spaces anymore. But people lump prison into one particular idea, and that's usually a place of violence or people who are always walking around with trauma. Yeah, we walk around with trauma, but we, we, we walk more in our humanity than anything. So that's what yeah. I meant by revealing my humanity. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. Anything else? Oh, yeah. I would like to know in particular if <laughs> drama therapy um, had any impetus in helping you accelerate this revelation of your humanity. And if you can think of any particular exercises or performance pieces where you were able to shine. Um, I'll say that, that um, 
drama therapy gave me the chance to help those next to me to be able to articulate themselves. Um, there were certain people that were still closed off and unable to articulate or um, be vulnerable in spots. And so one of the things that I really enjoyed about that space was being able to help the people next to me um, be vulnerable and be vulnerable with them. Um, so like there were a couple pieces where I had to go into my own childhood in order to feel what I was performing for that person. And, and in that it was, uh, it was freeing because one, I got to reveal an aspect of my life without actually revealing an aspect of my life, but being able to feel the emotion and stuff. And the other part was the person who I was doing this for um, got tremendous healing because now they could actually speak on it and they could, they could point to a spot and say, oh, you did that really well. Like, I believe that you found that pain. And then we could we would be able to speak on it in, in a way where it wasn't uh, shameful, hurtful, um, still traumatic though, but there was no judgment in it because now I'm sitting with this person in it. Thank you for that. It it's, takes courage to put yourself in such a vulnerable position. Do you think um, you were able to offer mentorship to people by demonstrating that yourself? Um, yeah. You know, I think I had more mentorship than a lot of the volunteers that come in because I have a lived experience that they didn't. And that's one thing that like drama therapy really helped me in is I was able to um, take the tools that I had and reveal it to the people standing next to me um, and help them along. Um, it's, it's hard to um, call myself a mentor or to, to put myself on a level above somebody you know, and, and maybe I, I, I read mentor or something wrong, you know, in, but I see it in a negative fashion. I would say that I was a help meet with somebody. I would say that I was a brother to somebody or however they wanted to see me, a sister, I don't care. But they saw me as somebody standing next to them and not so much teaching them, but walking with them through a, through a place. And I think that's what's kind of uh, gets lost in the whole, uh, um, therapy thing when it comes to drama because it's different when I'm sitting with you in it than I'm sitting outside of you and, and telling you about it. So I would say um, and, and if there was a mentorship going on it was it was uh, it was 50-50 because in order to be vulnerable, they had to give me something to be vulnerable with. Mm. And so it was, it was an offer that I took and then also offering myself back. So it worked both ways. It was a very uh, uh, equal relationship most time. And I think that's why um, it was effective in how we did it because we did it for each other. Were you always so humble? <laughs> no. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about your transformation um in what respect what you're comfortable with like who what kind of a person were you before you became so aware of um taking credit for things that you feel it's more uh on the part of both parties working towards something um i'll say uh my transformation happened early in my incarceration um, I was a very hurt, wounded, and angry person that was very rageful. Um, I didn't want to talk about things. I didn't trust anybody. I didn't want to trust anybody. It was just, you know, in the manner in which I grew up in many respects, the people I trusted the most are the ones that betrayed me the most um, and hurt me the most. And so uh, as time went by, I'll say before I got to uh, San Quentin, I was in Solano and I had a celly that was my little boy, Ralphie, man, like, you know, and we started to really like talk about, you know, cause I saw a lot of my rage in him, even though I wasn't in that space to still be snapping and stuff, I would see a lot of myself in him and um, taking the time to, you know, talk about why I did what I did and why he did what he did it helped us to like really change on how we're drawing things and how we're, we don't 
um, need to control. See, I was so out of control over my circumstances as a child that I was unable, that I wanted to control everything. And what I, what I knew most about how I grew up was violence controlled situations. The most violent had the most power, therefore I could control it. And it wasn't really trying to control the other person. It was trying to control my emotions from feeling sad, from feeling vulnerable, from feeling um, um, dismissed, from feeling condescended, all these different things that, uh, that I, I'm not condescended, I am strong, I am able, you know, you're not gonna victimize me type of thing. So now I'm gonna be the, uh, the predator in the situation. I'm gonna be the one taking control. I'm gonna be one taking action. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people would say that, um, you know, I was a sociopath at that time or narcissistic. I think that was too easy of an answer because it negated all the humanity that was in me. And that's what used to bug me is I'm not, I do feel, I just can't reveal how I feel. And I do want to do for others, but I just can't do for others because every time I do for others, I'm left with the short end of the stick. And I think those two terms need to really go away when talking about the incarcerated. Because once we do away with those two terms, then we can start to see the humanity within each person. And so that's one thing I started doing is I stopped seeing people as sociopaths and narcissists or somebody who was misogynist. All these were learned behaviors that I learned growing up that made me be like this because the safest people I seen around me acted like this because nobody touched them or hurt them. That's how I grew up in myself. So when I started looking, my faith is a big thing. You know, I'm, I'm very much a Christian and I'm very much a believer. And so I walked in, okay, um, you know, there are certain things I read in the Bible, like you're not given to fits of rage. Okay, how do I not, how am I not given to fits of rage? What do I do? Well, there's a cognitive behavior performance. Um, you know, the antecedent leads to the behavior, which leads to the consequences. So I had to figure out what was the antecedent to the, to the, to the behavior, you know, in other words, what are the thoughts and feelings going into it? And then once I found out, I could change my behavior, right? I can change my behavior and therefore the consequences would be different. So if I'm feeling like I'm being condescended per se, that's the antecedent. Somebody yells at me and I feel low and I start feeling condescended and selfish. I can either punch him in the face or I can self-talk and say, well, they, they may be having a bad day. They don't mean that towards me. Or I can say, hey, I'm not that person. My behavior changes. And then my consequences became different. And so I started living that role a little bit more and more. And then in that, I was able to reveal my humanity because my behavior, right, reflected my feelings now, all of my feelings, instead of just my anger or my rage or my self-protection. I won't call it selfishness, I'll call it self-protection. Because a lot of people uh, uh, um, who grew up in, in circumstances that we did, people outside of that are unable to understand uh, what it's like to be alone, left alone, and nobody to help them. And so if nobody's going to help me, then I'm going to help myself. And as you know, as we're young, we find the easiest route. And as we get older into adolescence, we continue that, that learned behavior because it's just so much easier. Um, then, and who wants to be hurt? Like nobody wants to be hurt or taken advantage of. That's the truth. It, it sucks. But a lot of people lived in a life where they weren't as um, um, flooded with the amount of hurt or betrayal. And so as time went by um, and I started walking this out, uh, I started grouping myself with other people that could help me and I could help them. So when I got to like Solano, you know, my celly, and then I had my friend, Chris Marshall, you know, who helps me also walk in a whole different things. And there's a difference between walking with humility and walking with surety. You can do both at the same time. You know, you can be assertive and respectful, you know, and I think that one of the uh, uh, um, blocks when people come to prison is that we're very assertive in what we want, 
but we're also respectful. But because people already have a, a, a lens in which they're lurk, looking at us, they think that that's being aggressive. When they would look at the person standing next to them who could demand the same thing and that person isn't aggressive because they see that person as an equal where they don't see us as an equal. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's years of learning how people have treated incarceration and how incarceration has been taught. Um, so, you know, that's another way, you know, of really revealing our humanity. And that was great. You just brought it all back to the revealing humanity. <laughs> that was great. Um, just, I mean, your wisdom, Carlos, is just like, just so like, great to hear your self-awareness is, is beautiful. Like, I wonder, was there, um, you know, any particular like writer that you read a lot of or anything else that that helped guide you to these like really really important you know self-discoveries it sounds like besides theater because we we want to of course you know always to yeah. say it's, it's theater but it sounds um, like there's so much more to this as well i would have to credit the people around me when i was incarcerated you know uh there were a lot of older gentlemen that um, you know, I spoke with and I would just take what they would give me. I, I'll, I'll give a big shout to always Chris Marshall, to, you know, uh, different friends through years, my uncle Johnny, um, uh, you know, Ron, just Ron Self, all these different people that I worked with in different uh, respects. Um, and, you know, even, you know, uh, yeah, it wasn't any writers really. You know, mm -hmm. I'll say one writer in particular that always helps me was Sun Tzu, you know, The Art of War, mm -hmm. because that is really not about war. It's about taking control of yourself and, and knowing what your what your uh, uh, what your abilities are. You know, they're, they're daily meditations on trying to figure out the world around you. And it doesn't actually have to be uh, uh, an actual war, or actual violence. It could just be a, a mental or a psychological understanding. Uh, yes, so much wisdom. And I was really drawn to the, I, this revealing humanity and um, the idea of a lot of volunteers, teaching artists, whoever it is coming in. And um, of course, we all walk into any space with preconceived notions, but, um, but definitely, I'm sure, at least at the beginning of our work into prisons, and I really, really want to hear more about, um, you touched on it a bit, but the four of us may have an opportunity at some point or already have opportunities to help train people to do this work. And so I'd love to hear about what, um, what are some key points that you think, um, you talked about revealing humanity, uh, dropping those preconceived notions. If you're in a lower level, it's definitely a huge possibility. You've done tons of work. If you've, you know, been in at least 10 years, there's obviously a lot of um, work and opportunity you've had. Um, I think these are really, I, no one ever, you know, said any of this to me. I had no, you know, idea of your guys's experience um, until talking to you personally. Um, but I think it could be really helpful in training for people to have more awareness of, you know, the people in the room versus like lumping them all together. So if there's any more you'd like to say about that, um, to pass on to us, that'd be great. I would say that, you know, if you're going into a theater group, treat them like other actors. You know, um, what I mean is everybody has a different personality in a different way. Um, uh, one thing that CDCR likes to do is say that everybody in there is a criminal, everybody's trying to get something from you, everybody's trying to do this. Um, and I would say, take that with a grain of salt, because for the most part, all of us wanted to be part of society, we just didn't know how to fit in. And then some of the times when we did want to fit into society, we were pushed to the side or marginalized in some respect or another. Um, we're, we're always trying to reveal who we are um, it takes time a little bit more for others. Um, you know, it's also realizing in prison, prison dynamics, who holds the power in the room and you refer to them. You don't refer to somebody that doesn't have power and give them power. You lose all respect. There is still a political, um, 
and and a hierarchy in prison per se as far as people who people trust to take them at, in the in the direction they want and what i mean is yes we have leadership roles that we are we're given in prison through all respects from the yard to the chow hall to the block everywhere and understand those and don't negate those because you can alienate somebody um that's one of the the bigger problems another cut the shit don't lie if you don't want to say something don't say it but never we have for the most part read every situation in every room for danger or not danger and one of the most dangerous things in a room is a liar because the liar no matter how big or how small creates dissension and when there's dissension in prison that really that usually leads to violence so it's it's if i'm not willing to reveal something i'm not willing to reveal and stand there but don't um don't take uh yeah i would say that is always tell the truth and if you can't tell the truth say i can't say that and you'll get a better response than i'll tell you later or that's not you know and another thing is is uh realize what rules are and what i mean is there are rules written against whole races and whole genders and when we hold those rules true for every space that we walk in we marginalize the people who the rules were against every rule is not made to help people most rules are made to help people gain advantage over other people if you look at them in society we've done away with a lot of them but a lot of them are still subtle and in place and if you can understand those rules and then find a way and i'm going to say it to break them but break them in a way that's healthy and helpful i would say do it you gain better allyship by bringing people in than by cutting them out and what I mean by allyship is in order for any of these programs to work, we make them work. The incarcerated does. No volunteers make any of them work. They, we, we've been doing a whole lot of this before anybody ever came in. If you look at most of the groups that have actually started and flourished were started by incarcerated people and not by people on the outside. Thank you. Um, um, Thanks, Carlos. Um, this uh, the, to your last point. Um, this is where I learned this. You know, working in the A yard at Lancaster Prison, after three years, that this there was a decade long process that the guys in the yard worked together to help create the environment that we could go in and have the educational programs and to really respect that, rather than thinking, oh, it was a great warden and then this other reformist person and then this other educational officer and then that other, but really it was the, the guys themselves who had had to, you know, they had come together, they created a document, they negotiated with the prison, you know, about what it would take for them to have uh, educational opportunity there and, they, and uh, learned, you know, learned a great deal in that process from learning some of their history. Um, you have this amazing theory of rehabilitation already, like, like you know, from the very first sentence that you said about the humanism, uh, you had all the different uh, ways in which you thought through what the rules are or not. Um, you, uh, and I was just wondering, like, how is your theory of rehabilitation and everything that you've said different from the sort of the common theory of rehabilitation that the, the, the norm that the prison authorities try to um, pull over our head, you know, you know often it's a, it's a very different one about, you know, what does it mean to, to be rehabilitated? So, and, and that's, that's part one of my question. And then part two is, if I can ask you also, what does performance mean to you in that sense? So how is performance a way of rehabilitation for you? as well to, to create the, 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 the kind of rehabilitation that you uh, that you have cho I mean like even what you said about labels no no not using narcissism and sociopath and misogyny and just 
in not pathologizing people, you know, all of that to really dig deep into the humanity and to work with with that, you know. So I was wondering what what does that re, what kind of rehabilitation and how, especially what kind of performance um, helps? How performance helps with rehabilitation? So I would I would say that CDCR looks at rehabilitation as uh, some are some people are able to uh, be rehabilitated and some people aren't. And what I mean is if you look at sentences, sentences will tell you who society thinks can be rehabilitated and who cannot. So if you look at somebody who has, I had 82 year sentence. As far as CDCR and everybody was concerned, I'm, I am not ever gonna be rehabilitated. Plain and simple, even today, as, as I go through paroles, they still don't believe that I'm a changed person. And I have all these rules and regulations upon me that, like, that, that, that uh, reveal that truth to me quite often. And I'm still gonna be me. I'm still gonna reveal my humanity in all of this. Um, so I would say everybody for me has, um, uh, a, a, a human revelation that the people have to understand. And what I mean is they, they have their humanity that they're trying to reveal. It may come out in different ways, different aspects, but everybody has it. Um, so, um, and then the, the idea to be rehabilitated, um, I believe that that's a colonized word and it's, it's an idea that everybody at one time was habilitated or given the same set of standards to live in to be able to be rehabilitated. So I think, I don't, I don't agree with that word as far as something that can be used, um, but we have nothing to really replace it right now. But so I'll, I'll just go along with that. And as far as um, performance art, man, it, it allowed me to reveal that I'm a performer that I do this, that I can act, that this has been a passion of mine forever. It was able, I, I was able to, you know, to do a TED talk and do greetings, right? And everybody's like, wow, I never knew that about you. See, I was able to reveal myself in that respect. So um, in the performance that I was given in that space uh, that, um, uh, was a veil to me, I utilized it the best way I could by showing, look, I'm an artist. This is what I do. I love to perform. I can direct. I can choreograph. I can write scripts. I can do all these things. And this was a place where I was able to do that. It wasn't, um, um, how can I put it? Um, I believe it I believe that the uh, the way the be able to be able to write, to be able to direct, to be able to exercise this part of who I was was uh, the therapy that I needed. Um, just like woodworking therapy, just like anybody who has a hobby or anybody who does these things, that's their therapy, you know. Um, so I'll say the therapeutic aspect for me was being able to reveal my humanity in that. Me and Banks, well, we invented what we call the uh, so hard spirit hug. <laughs> and what this hug is, is first you have to stop all what you're doing. Come completely in the presence of the other person. Stand heart to heart and enjoy one breath. <laughs> This summer I was teaching a course on performance and social change, but because of the lockdown, I wasn't able to uh, be there in person. So what we did is I had them write a script, they sent it to me, and then I had friends uh, perform it, and then I recorded it, and then we played it back in the prison two weeks later so they could watch their own performances and then respond to that. So that whole cycle of writing, scripting, and then seeing it perform stage and then back again, it was very powerful and really yeah. moving to have that opportunity. It just reminded me of what you said about the, all the different components of performance is how we can reveal our full humanity.
as well. So that's wonderful. Thank you. So Carlos, did you yeah. know about your love for acting and directing and choreography and writing before you were exposed to it, um, before you were incarcerated? Was that something you were exposed to or were you in, brought, was this brought to your attention? Do you know, do you know Luke Pageant? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's a little story. So me and Luke met in, in Shakespeare. And one day we're talking about um, uh, dance and ballet. And I was like, man, I always liked ballet as a kid. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I think I was five years old, I went and saw the Nutcracker in Sacramento. Right. And Luke was like, hold on, you, you were in Sacramento. I, he goes, I danced for that company. And I said, well, this was, he goes, but I was only there for like a year. I said, well, the year that I went there, they were uh, doing away with the plum fairy's dress. It was the last actual time they used that big dress while the kids come underneath, out from underneath. And he was like, I was in that one. Uh, you know, so here we have this connection through the arts and incarceration. Um, I'll say I've always been a performer. I've always been somebody who likes to, uh, to dance and sing, but I will say this, that the way I grew up and in and, and the environment that I had, um, it just wasn't conducive to safety. Um, you know, as far as gender roles, as far as, uh, um, race, um, you know, sometimes I would, you know, it's very, uh, in order to be Chicano, you can't dance ballet. You can't do Shakespeare. Um, and then also like when I would like to be able to dance or do certain things, my gender would get in the way because boys don't dance like that or move like that or want to um, dress like that. So um, at a very young age, I understood that uh, this was something that I did like, but I put that away from myself in a long time until the opportunity came for me to be able to, you know, reveal that within myself and around the world. And it's been received uh, very well. And I'm, I'm always grateful for that. Are you currently involved in performance work? Um, little by little, you know, one of the things about getting out after 25 years and being 44, I have no uh, retirement, I have no um, savings, you know, I'm basically a middle aged person getting out into the world and having to pay bills and do stuff. So um, I'm kind of behind the eight ball on this, I would love to be able to perform and I've done a few things for Marine Shakespeare and I'm trying to figure out ways to be able to do that. Um, but in the near future, I got to eat <laughs> and I got to think about my future, you know, um, and I'm sure I will do it. You know, I do have plans to, to do the, to, uh, uh continue performing. Um, I've already written a screenplay that, that I've had written since 2002, you know, so I have things that I've done in the past that I've written down that I want to be able to do. But like I said, you know, it's 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 hard when uh, if I get sick or if I get hurt and my paycheck goes away, then I may not be as well off. Now, I do have family that will help me, but, you know, exactly how far I never want to find out. Right. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, we're hopefully we can also find some clips, video clips of your performances and incorporate into the editing of this video. And I will run it by you for sure when we finish editing it. We want to run it by you, make sure that you're okay with it. Then we'll post this uh, with our, we have a YouTube channel where we have all these different interviews with the drama therapist and with different performance artists. Um, so we'll make sure that you're okay with it that if you can post it as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank Carlos, you. You, you did so many different shows inside. <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, since I first, you know, had the, the privilege to work with you, that if there was one in particular or a couple in particular that you would, you feel 
you know, most pride about or just like really stuck with you more than others that you would want us to, to find some clips from? Well, I would say uh, Dr. Caius always, because hmm. he was one of my favorites. Um, I would also have to say Amelia, you know, that was one of my um, more challenging roles. Uh, and uh, which one was it where Nate played the Duke? Uh, the two brothers, what was that called? Um, How many bears? Did you guys the two that? gentlemen of Verona or was no, it? No, it was the, the other one right one before, before that. that. Um, remember when he played the Duke and he was, mm -hmm. um, and he played two, he was, a. Uh, it was the one with, um, where the, the Isabella is a nun and she goes yes. to the prison. What's that measure one? Measure for measure. Measure for measure. Measure for measure. I like measure for measure too. The character I play there, I believe I play it with a Scottish accent. So that's like one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, there's one other other character. He only shows up for like three, oh. four seconds. <laughs> I already know. Yeah, Marianne knows who I'm talking about. Doug. Doug. <laughs> is this a parallel play? Yeah. Yes. Yes, this is <laughs> one that Roach wrote. Yeah, Roach wrote it. Roach wrote it. Yeah. Okay, okay, now I really want to see it. I, think it was I believe it was raised by the state. Yeah. I think that was the one. But yeah, I love Doug. That's That character's infamous with so many four, different people. Three years ago? Four years ago? I want to say maybe four years ago. Yeah. I have a question. I think we have two minutes left. But to, okay. if you had something to share with someone who was thinking about, you know, approaching theater, drama therapy, or the creative arts or anything like that, what would you say to them to, um, you know, give them some insight of, of why they should or shouldn't? Man, I would say, uh, man, if you're going to do theater, just be open to everything. Say yes. The best thing you can do in theater is just say yes and. Beautiful. <laughs> Yes, and. <laughs> All right. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So wonderful to meet you, Carlos. Yeah. Nice to meet All you all and re meet some of you. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. Thank you for your time. This was great.